And uh, I was about to say we are all Senegalians now, but are we also all Ethiopians, RKB? Uh, so the floor is yours. And uh, I would like to say about you also that you are the author or the editor of a number of very important books, not only in Ethiopia, but uh, also on uh, economic development uh, in, in a large sense. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Siri. Uh, first, I have to, to thank you and express uh, my appreciation for the great work uh, that contributes to uh, creating a new way of understanding of global issues. And I'm referring to the contribution of uh, IFRI and the World Policy Conference, which I have found to be quite, quite important contribution. So we thank you for, for this, and uh, I would ask the, my colleagues here to applaud for the great job uh, Thierry had done. It's now considered as one of the leading think tanks, although we know that um, most of the leading think tanks are in the US, and, and, uh, and this is being ranked as one of the leading global think tanks, and um, I'm really uh, happy about this. And uh, I also congratulate my sister Aminta for the great job our Singapore colleagues are doing, and uh, maybe one of the few female uh, uh, prime ministers, uh, and uh, I congratulate you, Aminta. So let me start with the point Sherry raised. Are we all Ethiopians? This was a question. And the answer is yes. And I have a good reason. The human origin comes from Lucy. Lucy is founded in Ethiopia, and its uh, human remain 3.5 million years old. And this is in Ethiopia. So your origin, uh, your grand, 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 grandparents are from Lucy, Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is also known for being one of the first countries who accepted Judaism. That's why there are Ethiopian Jews, and this is, uh, goes far beyond uh, the uh, before Christ. Uh, then Ethiopia is also, we're talking with Aminta, uh, one of the, actually, one of the oldest Muslim countries. The first mosque was built in the seventh century, and followers of, Mo followers of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, when they were not welcomed in Saudi, the Ethiopian king at that time, Nugus, welcomed them. They, he, they settled. He gave them land. He was a Christian king. And since then, even Prophet Muhammad said that every Muslim should never, should never uh, 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 declare war on Ethiopia. And, and this makes it the oldest uh, Muslim country. But it's also one of the oldest Christian countries. Christianity has a long history. Uh, so we are a very diverse uh, society in terms of religion, and, uh, but people tolerate each other, and in some places, Muslims and Christians also marry each other. We are also a diverse society. Uh, so uh, coming back to the prestigious uh, award our Prime Minister has received, I would like to say a few words about this issue. One of the main reasons that our Prime Minister was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize was he 
took a very bold initiative to end a 20 years old uh, war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which may not be politically popular and uh, without major intermediaries, the two leaders met and agreed to make a peace and our prime minister took uh, the first initiative. And uh, now Ethiopia and Eritrea are in peace and we also appreciate all friends who facilitated uh, this uh, great peace, including Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, UAE and, and other leaders. Our prime minister also, one of the first initiatives was uh, he traveled to Cairo and directly appealed to the Egyptian people that Ethiopia is committed for a peace with Egypt and that uh, Grand Renaissance Dam is also to be built with the common interest in mind. So he uh, also made it clear that we need to closely work together. So peace has been a major focus of our prime minister in the area. The second uh, reform our prime minister had focused was on governance issue. Uh, one of the changes in our uh, political system or government has been uh, an increased involvement of uh, female. And here now our uh, president is President Salwar, a female president. The supreme judge is female, Maza, Judge Maza. And 50% of the cabinet members are also female. And also the speaker of the House of Federation is a female. Female are good to lead a country. And of course, we can learn from the Germans. Merkel, we can see uh, the first leader who has been able to, uh, to, to be in the chancellor's position for a long time. So this has been a major uh, intervention in the governance area and also additional economic reforms. But the key point is, why is Ethiopia raised, uh, the name of Ethiopia raised in, in many platforms? And there is one, one important reason. Since 1991, Ethiopia has been able to, to initiate a very fast economic growth. The country is big in population, and uh, between 1975 and 1991, during the military regime, uh, the economy was stagnant, and we had a big war. And after, in the 90s, a new constitution was adopted, a multi-party system was adopted, and the country focused on recovery. So it's now considered by IMF and the World Bank as the fastest growing economy because the economy has been growing by 10.5% for continuous 15 years. And this has been twice Africa's average growth rate, which was about uh, 5 to 5.5%. And this has been one of the key recognition of uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia does not have petroleum, does not have diamonds, big resources, and this entire growth was achieved especially by the hardworking people of uh, Ethiopia and Ethiopia also focused to attract uh, investment. In terms of uh, uh, social indicators or improvement of uh, uh, the livelihood of uh, the people, there has been some significant, not sufficient, but the achievement has been quite, quite, uh, quite important. A key indicator while going, while not talking about education, health, uh, food security, etc. one critical indicator is the uh, average life expectancy. If people are able to live longer, it means there is relatively better improved health services, improved food security, education, etc. So the key progress in this respect was in 1991, the average life expectancy in Ethiopia was 44, and Africa's average life expectancy was 50, whereby 
10 years uh, behind Africa's average. In 2016, the average life expectancy in Ethiopia has reached 66, which is a 21 years increment in average life expectancy. And compared with Africa's average in, 19, in uh, 2016, which was 60, uh, this is twice uh, the average increment. And this is an important indicator because growth has to benefit uh, the public. However, the country has also been focused on improving uh, and focusing also on long-term investment. One key area where the country has focused was on education, but not education, pr uh, primary schools only. In primary schools now, we have 30 million population are studying in primary schools. We have big population. It's the second populous country in Africa, 100 million. And every year, the population is growing by 2 million. 2 million are usually, uh, to give an indication, the significance, I always say, say that uh, the population grows every year means twice the size of Mauritius every single year. So here, education becomes quite critical. The most important education reform Ethiopia conducted was the transformation of university systems and the introduction of technical schools. And in transforming the universities and technical schools, we tried to see alternative systems, and we found out that uh, the German system is more appropriate to us, the, especially the apprenticeship system of technical schools. So for the last 15 years, we have had a reform transforming the system, and currently, the number of technical schools has increased from three schools in 1991 to 1,300 technical schools who can train 1 million technicians every single year. The second major expansion and transformation has been in university system. We only had three universities, and the intake capacity was only 5,000. With the reform made, this has increased now to 50 public universities in addition to hundreds of uh, private colleges and universities, and also the number of students in public universities has reached half a million. And every year we have 100,000 uh, university graduates from public, from public universities. But more importantly, the major change was the university education had focused on social sciences and humanities. While economics is important, linguistics is important, but for rapid economic transformation, engineering is important and technology is critical. So the major shift has been from 85% social sciences and humanities courses, we shifted to 70% in natural science technology, and engineering. And from this 70%, 40% has to be in engineering. And we have basically achieved to uh, this uh, level, and uh, we had to train thousands of lecturers with PhD, and the government also spent a lot of money on this. We brought in 500 Germans, and as you know, the Germans are expensive, uh, and all this, uh, their salary was paid by our treasury. We wanted their technical skills. So education and human capital has been a prime focus. Second prime focus has been infrastructure. You cannot sustain rapid economic growth without infrastructure. However, infrastructure is not a quick fix. Building a hydro power has a long gestation period. At least you need minimum 10 years from inception to completion. So you have to think uh, long term. 
and Ethiopia had focused on infrastructure, building energy, uh, expanding highways, expanding rural roads, now building electric-powered railway systems. And our government has been spending close to 50% of its federal budget on expansion of universities, I mean, uh, infrastructure. This has helped us to attract more investment. In the last six, seven years, the FDI is increasing, inflow is increasing in Ethiopia. In 2017, the Ethiopia had, uh, was the, one of the major destinations of FDI in Africa, an increment of 50% uh, uh, that year. Between 2012 and 2017, the FDI size has increased by four times. And the key aspect is 89% of all FDI inflow to Ethiopia has been in manufacturing. And I should like to note on this occasion a misperception that it's only the Chinese who are investing in Ethiopia. That's not the case. If you look at infrastructure, one of the major infrastructure projects, for instance, is being built by uh, a Turkish company, railway company, and it has been financed by Credit Suisse and the consortium of many banks from Europe. European Investment Bank has been financing important infrastructure. On the investment side, in some sectors, it's mainly Europeans who have dominated specific sectors. At floriculture, a very dynamic sector for exports, uh, it has been dominated entirely by Europeans, and there is not even a single Chinese. In food and beverage, the major investors are uh, Europeans. So in brewery industry, which is growing fast, and it's growing at uh, a rate of 25% every single year. Uh, we find uh, companies like Diageo from UK, Castile Group from France, uh, Bavaria from, and Henneken from Holland, and other companies also from Germany. So I would like to highlight that the government is continuously improving the business climate and you can, when you invest in Ethiopia, you can also find the right type of skills from university graduates to technicians. One of the good things is that uh, although French is not widely spoken, but English is widely spoken, which makes it easy for know-how transfer. So these are the few points I would like to highlight. I would also like to add as it's important to indicate uh, that the European and African partnership is important. And here, a good initiative by G20 and also many European uh, countries is the G20 compact with Africa. And Ethiopia is one of the uh, few countries selected to be part of this process. If I'm not mistaken, also Senegal is part of this uh, priority list. So this is an opening that will encourage a broader partnership between our continent and, uh, and Europe. I was at uh, uh, one of the ports of Morocco, uh, and it's just 15 kilometers away from Europe. So these two continents are basically like one big region, and it's very important to think of the potential of this continent. Now the population of Africa is 1.2 billion. By 2050, it's going to increase to 2.5 billion. 25% of the world's population will be living in Africa. By year 2100 or 2100, after eight years, 4.5 
billion population will be living in Africa, which is going to be 35%. This is a challenge, a challenge for job creation, because currently now Africa needs to create 20 million jobs every single year, minimum. But this is also a huge opportunity. This is a demand. This is a market. This is a new economic opportunity. This is also a source for productive investment. Productions could be, facilities could be established in Africa, and, and this could also contribute to con competitiveness of uh, foreign companies. Well, thank you very much, RTB. This is also a fascinating uh, presentation, and I think we heard about two uh, highly successful uh, cases uh, illustrating, like the other day uh, about Rwanda, that uh, Africa uh, has a huge potential for development. Mm -hmm.